I want to read for you Revelations, the second chapter, verse number two. It says, I know thy works, and thy toil and patience, and that thou canst not bear evil men. And didst try them that call themselves apostles, and they are not, and didst find them false. I want you to know that where, no matter where you are, where you're sitting at this moment, I want you to know that God has you here for a reason. And no matter how pretty you made yourself, how handsome you made yourself, God knows who you are. You can put all the lipstick on, all the beijing on, all the, all the nice little things you want, but at the end of the day, God knows who you are. And so I want you to ask yourself, ask your neighbor, where are you? Are you here amongst the saints fellowshipping? Are, 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 you, are you here to praise and worship? Or is your mind somewhere else? Is it somewhere else? I want to direct you to my actual text. Romans, the first chapter. Starting at verse number seven. Romans, the first chapter, starting at verse number seven. If you have it, say, let's connect. The Bible reads to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both of you and me. Now I do not want to be, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and unwise. So much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also kindly bow with me in a word of prayer dear god our loving and merciful father lord we come to you at this time and we just say thank you lord we thank you for allowing us to wake up and be in our right minds allowing us to have participation in this fellowship that you call the church lord we ask as we get ready to dive into a portion of your word lord that we open our hearts, we open our minds to what you would have us to hear. Lord, we thank you for the mission that you gave this church, the mission that you gave your people to be a blessing to the world, to make you known to all men. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Christ Jesus, Lord, in order to establish a relationship with us. Let us always be mindful of that relationship and that we always seek to nurture and protect it. Lord, we love you and we just say thank you again. In Christ Jesus' name I pray that all those under the sound of my voice say, Amen. Amen. You know, you can tell a lot about a person from the things that they speak of and the things that they are thankful for. The Bible says, for out of the abundance of a man's heart doth the heart speak. Meaning that whatever is in you will eventually come out of you. There is no such thing as a Freudian slip. When I speak to my kids, I am constantly reminded of where their heart lies with their constant requests for iPad time, Xbox time, LOL dolls, and UGO cards. But when I listen to my son pray, when I listen to him and I watch him bow his head, there is a revelation of what is actually on his heart. You see, as my son Cameron prays, he he prays for his family, you know, his mom, his dad, and his brothers, I mean his sister. He prays for the food that is in front of him, but then he begins to name 
his extended family. He names his little cousins, Gianna and Dominique and Danielle and Denise, and he loves his little cousins. But he names his grandfather and a grandmother because he has a special relationship to his grandparents. And it is with this understanding that we see the heart of Paul in this text. Paul writes this, what I call a love letter to the church at Rome, unlike his other letters to the church at Ephesus and Galatia, who had somehow veered away from the faith. But Paul makes this, reaches out to the church in Rome in a time where the Jews had already been expelled from Rome on these two occasions. You see, there was this time where they had swindled a, a Roman citizen out of her money, and then there was this instigation at the name of this person named Crestus. As written in historical books, Crestus is a reference to this Christ. Anytime you want to have some problems, just start talking about religion or politics. But the Jews had been expelled, and although he had never visited the churches there, he wanted to establish a connection with them. This letter is sometimes referred to as the constitution of Christian theology where we find Paul revealing the grace and power of the gospel of Christ Jesus to make us no longer enemies of God but sons and daughters, those of us that have been baptized into Christ. Being that we have been buried with Christ, we are dead to sin and we have been freed socially from the slavery of sin. We have been freed politically from the petty politics. We have been freed economically from the exasperating echelons of imperialism and freed spiritually into a ritualistic religion, into a righteous renaissance of today. Jesus said a time is coming and now has come where true worshipers must worship me not only in spirit, but in truth. Paul writes here what is the type of paranesis for Christian living or a, what we call a praxis. You know, whenever a, a teacher had students, he would give them a type of paranesis or ways to live out your faith. And so Paul, just like all great teachers, offers this paranesis in the orders of Christian conduct. Starting in chapter 12, he tells them, he says, I beseech you, brethren, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. This is how you live one to another. This is how Christians ought to behave with each other. But then he goes on within chapter 13. And if you want to know how to live when America is being made great again, read chapter 13. It is for those very reasons Rome, Romans is considered the PX90 of Christian living. If you find yourself huffing and puffing every time the preacher mentions a prayer meeting or gospel meeting, you may be a little out of shape spiritually. Every now and then I look through my closet. Just recently, we, my wife and I, we relocated and I was looking through all the clothes that I can no longer fit. It is a reminder of the shape that I allow myself to get out of because of the things I allow to permeate my body tend to be unhealthy at times. And I believe that we as Christians from time to time allow things to infiltrate our psyche through ways of media, through music and television and the videos that we watch that allows us to get a little out of shape. If you find yourself unable to fit spiritual events in your calendar, in your tight calendar, you may have gotten a little too big spiritually. If you find it difficult to squeeze your ego and selfish wants in time and your treasure into the church and its mission, you've gotten a little big. But what is the measure of a Christian? And I believe in this letter, Paul gives us an indication of what a Christian should look like. You see, Paul knew that the people served the Lord for many reasons. There are some people who serve because of legalism. It is required for heaven. And so you see them every Sunday, every Wednesday, because they believe that is what is required for salvation. They give their tenth of their money. And they do this in such a legalistic manner. They, they make sure that they say the right prayers at the right time and all the right sayings. They serve out of legalism. Some serve because they want to be like Diotrephes. They want the preeminence. This is the only time during the week where somebody recognizes them as being a leader. Some do it simply because of money, or what Paul referred to as filthy lucre. 
They have been gifted with the, with the ability to either speak eloquently or be able to carry a tune. And so they know that they can get, be blessed for their talents. But then there are some that serve in various missions like our brothers of the Latter-day Saints. When they graduate high school, they serve for two years in the field. You see them on their bikes. Two deacons going up and through the neighborhood because they believe that is what is required for salvation. There are people within the framework of Christianity even today who, who serve the Lord out of some type of religious karma, believing that if I don't serve the Lord, then just like the children of Israel, God is going to burst my spiritual bubble. I can't ask the Lord for things if I ain't been going to church. I can't, I, I can't ask the Lord to, to bless my finances if I ain't been giving. And so they have this, this, this bad theology or, or religion that they live by. And that is the reason why they serve. Paul was very familiar with the various ways that men tried to demonstrate service. We can see that in Philippians 1 and 15. Paul says, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to any to add any affliction to my bonds, but the others of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Paul knew that people preached the gospel for various reasons, but his attitude was as long as they're preaching the gospel, then go on and let it do what it do. God is being recognized, and that's great. And so what we have here is Paul writing to the church, letting them know that there are external means of trying to show your service. But that is not what God is looking for. Paul was very familiar with the way Pharisees demonstrated their ritualistic performances. But Paul frames his, spirit, his service under the framework of spiritual. His initial statement in the beginning opening chapter says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Now the word servant there is actually bond servant or doulos. Now you need to understand what a doulos or what a bond servant was. An example is given in Exodus, the 21st chapter. He says that when a slave had completed their service, if he went out and he said that, I love my master, neither me nor my wife or my family shall leave and I will stay, then the master was to bring him before the judges and the elders of the city and they were to put an all through his ear meaning that he had moved out of command of service to commitment. And I believe that in the scriptures that Christ, that God is calling us to move from command to commitment. When we look at the text, Paul opens in the first verse, in verse number, he says, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. If we want to know what it means to be spiritually in shape, you have to understand that a Christian is thankful. Paul was thankful for the work God was doing in their lives despite what was going on in his very own life. See, you have to understand that though Paul was a great apostle, Paul was being persecuted. When we look in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, we see that the governor of Damascus had sought to kill Paul. And Paul had to be smuggled out of the city in a basket through a window. You see, some of us struggle with being thankful because we struggle with what's going on in our own lives. In psychology, there is a concept called cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortions are things that, that, that skew our thinking and our viewpoint towards ourselves and the world. Many times within the church, we as Christians suffer from the cognitive distortion of self-globalization. Now, self-globalization is where I am constantly comparing myself to other people like me. And when I'm constantly comparing myself to other people, I can't be happy what's going on in my life, much less theirs. It's hard for me to be thankful what's going on in my own circumstances or much less yours when I see the Lord is blessing you with a vibrant job. With a vibrant marriage. When you got good looking kids and I look at my kids and 
or you got smart kids. And I look at my kids. You see, self-globalization doesn't allow me to be happy for other people, despite what's going on in my own world. You see, Paul was thankful for this fellowship. You see, a sign of being out of shape is when we tend to run from the fellowship of other believers. Now, Paul was aware of what was going on within the churches of Rome because we were on the cusp of globalization. When it says that Christ came in the fullness of time, that means roads have been developed, aqueducts have been developed. There was, a, there, was a, there was a government that was overseeing the land and communication was able to flow freely because of the reign of the Roman Empire. And so Paul was able to gain knowledge of what was going on within the churches of Rome because of this freedom of information. You see, Paul was thankful for the conversion of others. When we look at Romans 6 and 17, it says, but God be thanked that you were once servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered unto you. How many of you are thankful for the fellowship of the saints, not just here? I remember as a kid riding down the road, I would feel a sense of pride when I would drive through Texas and Oklahoma and I'd see the Church of Christ meets here. We are not just a group to ourselves, but we are part of a larger fellowship. And we should be thankful for those that wear the name of Christ. Paul was thankful. Even when facing certain harm, there's an account in Acts, the 21st chapter, when they were asking Paul, Paul, please don't leave. Do not take this trip. They said, if you leave, we know things, the bad things are going to take place. It was so bad that a, a certain prophet came down by the name of Agrippus. And he told Paul, he said, Paul, if you take this trip, there's going to be some bad things. There's going to be some consequences and repercussions. Consequences and repercussions is what he told Paul. And what he did is that he took Paul's girdle, which was his belt, and he wrapped it around his wrist. And he said, Paul, if you take this trip, thus will be the same to you. Paul didn't care. He didn't care. For he said, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always, in my prayers. The shape of a healthy Christian is one that is looking for God to be their witness. Now I want you to understand something. Says whenever you see service in the New Testament, the word that is actually used is letreo, or spiritual service, or spiritual worship. Now worship is a derivative of worthy of my body's service. So when we worship, we are saying that this is worthy of my body's service. I want you to get that. Whenever Paul makes mention of service in the New Testament, he is speaking of spiritual worship. Now, worship is not something that we engage in. We have such a, a westernized view of what, of what worship is. Because, the, because of the Catholic Church, we understand worship to be, you come in, you pray, you sing, and you listen to the word, and you give your money, and you've worshiped for the day. But that is not what Paul is talking about. That's not what he's talking about. You see, when we say that something is worthy of our body's service, when we worship it, Paul is saying, I don't do this to be seen by men, but I do this to be seen my God. I recall the time when I was a boy, I, 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 I just wanted to be seen. I, I remember growing up at Reseda of Vaughn Street, Brother Fuller was there. He remembers me as a little boy. I remember watching him and the other men as they stood in front of the table getting ready to serve and I just asked, Daddy, can I just stand up there with the men and just, and just hold my hands? I didn't know what they were doing. I just wanted to be up there. I wanted to be important. But I want you to understand that a Christian serves with his heart. Years ago when I was a boy, I recall, I recall a time that every year in Los Angeles, we would have what is called the Campaign for Christ. 
similar to the crusade, the campaign for Christ lasted for about a month. And every year we would bring out Dr. Evans or Dr. Billy Washington to preach. Well, it just so happened that one time my parents, they decided to go and they left us behind, but they had given us explicit instruction that you guys be in bed by 8.30. Now we knew that it took about an hour to get from the San Fernando Valley to the Carson Center, ain't that right, Brian? And we knew that once Dr. Evans got into the pulpit, that he would be at least 50 to 65 minutes once he was there. And we knew that once he finished his sermon that he would be another 15, maybe 20 minutes extending the invitation. And we knew that it would take them at least an hour to get back home. And so just like other kids, we played the numbers game. Eight o'clock rolled by, we not sweat. Nine o'clock rolled by, 10 o'clock, finally 11.30 came along. And we heard that garage door go up. And like four little kids, we ran and we put our heads in the window. We saw there was a Cadillac pulling in, closed the window, ran to our bedroom, shut the door. I was rudely awakened by the slap of a leathery strap across my backside as my father awoken me and my three other siblings and lined us up. And he gave us the business, if you know what I mean. But before he was finished, he stamped the scripture in my heart. Ephesians 6, 6, not with eye service as men pleavers, but as unto God, meaning that when we do our service, when we are worshiping our God, we are not doing it to be seen by others. But we are doing it because we are known that God is omnipresent and watches and sees all things. When you are at your job, are you doing it to be a, a men pleaser? Switching between Facebook and your work. How do you do your worship? Because when you're in your car, you're worshiping. When you're at your home, when you're dealing with your wife, when you're dealing with your kids, you're worshiping. What does your worship look like? What does it look like? You know, we, we, we act a certain way when we know other people are watching us parent our kids. We act like we that loving parent. But as soon as, the, as soon as the eyes are wandering away, all of a sudden we become Thanos. Ready to snap our finger and expect them to move. Paul understood that a Christian serves out of love, out of commitment, but he served to be witnessed by God. I want you to understand not only that, he says that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Paul was not only, giving, was not only praying for the Romans, but that God would use them, would use him to the benefit. How many of you are so concerned about those outside of the church? You guys want Mountain View to grow? Raise your hand if you want Mountain View to grow. Now those of you that didn't raise your hand, I just assume you don't want other people sitting next to you so you don't want the, the extra bodies. But what are you doing to bring people here? Paul had so much love for the church in Rome that he wanted to be the instrument of their help. How many times do we pray ourselves to be the instrument of the person's assistance? So many times the attitude is if I can just get them to church, then Brother J.K. and Brother Reese and, and the elders, they're going to go ahead and do their thing. But that is not what God has called us here to do. We are all a royal priesthood. and We've all been made ministers of the gospel. Paul says in verse Number 11, you see a little bit more of his heart. He reminds me of an old balladeer. He says, for I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, that to the end that you may be established, the word established is therizo, which is to make strong. That is, that I may be comforted together with you and by mutual faith that you and me can be strengthened together. 
Do you not know that when you miss fellowshipping here with your brothers, you miss the opportunity to encourage those that are within the fellowship of the faith? Now, I want you to understand, fellowship is not what we do when we get together and we have some chicken, spaghetti, and salad. If you notice in the, in the Lord of the Rings, the very first movie we call Lord of the Rings, the fellowship of the ring. You see, the fellowship was that they were all together with a common purpose and a common goal to get that ring to its destination. And those of us that are called saints, that are Christians, we are all gathered together in the fellowship because we're trying to get our brothers and sisters to the same destination. That is the fellowship that we share in together. Paul reminds me of Marvin Gaye. He says, for I long to see you. Are you concerned for the church? Are you concerned for the state of the church? To the point that it moves you to the action. When you look across your numbers and you see that the church at large is dwindling in its numbers and that the median age for the church is about 55 and older, are you concerned for the church? Not only that, are you concerned for the marginalized of society? I want you to understand that it's written within the DNA of God's people to seek social justice. Some people may get uncomfortable with this, but I want you to know social justice has always been a part of who God is as a person. You want to know how Ruth was able to eat and her mother? Because of the social justice that God had wrote in the scriptures. God was ready to destroy a people because of the social injustices that were taking place. When we look at Amos, it says in the sixth chapter that even the righteous know to hold their tongue, knowing that righteousness cannot be found. We have a responsibility as the children of God to seek social justice wherever it may be. Does it bother you to see children being torn from their parents? Does it bother you to see our senior citizens having their, 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 their social security ripped from them? Does it bother you to see children going hungry because programs that were once used to feed children are called entitlements? I'm not here to preach right or left philosophy. But I want us to understand that we must understand what the word of God says and lift it up as the standard and not be caught up in our petty politics. Paul says, he says, making requests if by means now at length that I might have a prosperous journey. I want you to understand that a Christian loves to the point of sacrifice. A Christian is loving. When we see, it says, in Romans 5, 8, it says, God commended his love, and while yet we were sinners, Christ died. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. I want you to understand that whenever love is mentioned within the New Testament, it's always of a sacrificial nature. How many of you can sit here and say that I love the church to the point of sacrifice? Paul wanted to have a prosperous journey. Even though he was facing certain death and he knew people wanted to hear, wanted to harm him. Can you say that you're thinking about the church when you're in survival mode? Do you think about the well-being of God's children when you're in survival mode? Your giving will show otherwise. It's funny how we get in survival mode. All of a sudden we start trimming the fat. And a lot of times that ends up being our giving. Paul has called us to love to the point of sacrifice. Because when you love, you seek fellowship. You see, people that, that don't love, they run away from fellowship. They don't want to be loved. They don't know how to be loved. And sometimes they're so full of hell, they, they can't wait to get to the parking lot because they're afraid the hell that's in them is going to pour out. See people running towards the door as soon as they say amen. I want you to understand the Christians love to the point of sacrifice and they run towards the fellowship. Now I want you to see something here. Paul says, making requests if by any means now are linked that I have a prosperous journey that by the will of God that I come to you. I want you to understand also that a Christian is submissive to the will of God. A Christian is submissive to the will of God. You see, 
a lot of times we, we lose sight of the fact that God is sovereign. God is sovereign and, and, and at times it may seem as though he doesn't care about what's going on in our lives because we don't, we don't recognize his presence moving in and around us. But I want you to know that a Christian recognizes the power of God and submits to it. That's why Jesus says in Matthew, he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't understand how people can buy into a theology where they say, if you claim it in the name of Jesus, it shall be yours. Like we got some type of cheat code to, to get God to respond to us. It's up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, select, start. It don't work that way. You see, when we think we have a cheat code, then all of a sudden we have made ourselves God and God moves to our whim and our power. We make plans as though there is no God. Do you know how many people made plans, but it was ruined by the fact that they died? I'm reminded constantly of my, of my, own, of, of my own human frailty. Being reminded constantly that once you reach a certain age, the expiration on the, 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 the warranty on your health kind of expires. And you're moving by the will of God at that point. I'm on blood pressure pills, taking all type of medication, got upset because the doctor didn't refill my prescription. But at the end of the day, I have to understand that it's by the will of God that we move and that we have our very being. And it's only when we recognize God and, and his power that God will allow us to move forward. Some of us are stuck in the same circle because we refuse to submit to God's will. When you look at Jonah, we see that Jonah was running from the will of God, but it took a great fish or a whale, according to what passage you're reading, in order for him to submit to the will of God. God tells us in Matthew, go you into all the world. Some of us go, but say, I ain't talking. And therefore, God holds you in place until you recognize his power. I want you to understand, Paul says that in verse number 12 and 13, he says, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Verse number 13, he says, now I do not want you to be ignorant, brother, that oftentimes I purpose to come to you but I was not allowed to, that I might also have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I want you to understand that a, a servant must be fruitful in producing fruit. We can see passage after passage of, of God, of Jesus, demanding fruitfulness in, in his servants' lives. I want you to understand that God expects a growth. And growth is representative by fruit. You see it within the very laws of nature that when a plant becomes mature, it produces a flower or fruit. I want you to understand that you cannot produce fruit if you're not mature. Let me say that again. A Christian cannot produce fruit if you're not mature. Now you ain't me asking, well, what type of fruit was Paul talking about? I want you to understand that a, a Christian is fruitful in three ways. There are three types of spiritual fruit. One is in spiritual attitudes, as given in Galatians 5.22. It's of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience. Against such, there is no law, meaning you can get as much of this as you want. If you're not able to demonstrate peace in your life, you may be a little immature. If you're unable to love your brother or sister when they're talking to you, but they demonstrate some characters you can't quite get along with, you might be a little immature. When we can't be long-suffering with one another, when we can't demonstrate these spiritual attitudes, when we can't demonstrate these fruits in our lives, we are demonstrating that of an immature child. The other thing, Paul was looking to produce in others righteous actions. Righteous actions. When we look at Romans 6 and 22, it says, But now being made free from sin to become service to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. 
Meaning that you used to be slaves to sin. But now we have been made slaves to righteousness. Being slaves to righteousness means that we are producing righteous acts. These righteous acts are displayed when we are feeding the poor. When we're looking after the sick, when we're, when we're visiting those that are in prison, when we seek social justice, those are the righteous acts that we're looking to provoke one another to do. But lastly, Paul was seeking to have new converts. The sign of a, of a spiritually mature and a Christian that is in spiritual shape is one that produces new converts. Do you not know that you are discipling people? Whether you realize it or not, you are discipling other, other folk. And if you're a parent, you're especially discipling people. And the question I want to ask you parents is what type of disciples are you raising? You see, the gospel that your children leave the house with is the gospel that you pour into them. And if you are not raising them in the ways of of the Lord then your child will, will only breathe from the gospel of selfishness pettiness lying deceitfulness these are the type of disciples that we raise when we're not mindful of who's following us you see Paul was looking to have new converts when we look at Romans 16 and verse number 5 Scripture tells us, it says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house and salute my well-beloved Epaeonatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto God. Paul was looking to have new converts. And Mountain View, I, I'm asking you, what shape are you in right now? Are you able to be thankful for others when things are going on in your life? Do you serve out of commitment? Or because it was written down in your Bible and that's the command. You see, God raised the children of Israel all the way from Egypt by giving them the law. And they moved by command. But when we get to the New Testament, Christ was telling, I am now looking for that commitment. To where you say, I love my master. Neither me or my household shall leave. And it is that point that he puts a mark on your body. That is the mark of the Holy Spirit that is, that is born through baptism. You see, the Bible teaches us you will know them by their fruits. Yes. And what type of fruit do people know you by? Do they know you because you got attitude and you're real quick to let people know where you're coming from and where they can get off at? That's why the Roman writer, he beseeches them constantly. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. And do not be conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is your reasonable worship. You know, they say the, the problem with the living sacrifice is the tendency of that sacrifice to crawl off the altar. So many times we want to let people know what we're thinking what they need to do, where they need to go. But Paul says we have been called into the light. Stand on your feet, Mountain View. Stand on your feet. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize that, you know, I, I'm a little out of shape. I realize every time they, they talking about Bible class, be here for Bible class, be here for VBS, be here for prayer meeting, I start huffing and puffing in my spirit because I got a lot of don't wanna. Or maybe you hear and you realize, you know, I, 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 I got a lot of hate in my life. I wasn't born a hater, but I was made a hater. Every time I see something taking place good in my brother's and sister's life, it's hard for me to feel happy for them because nothing's going on in my life. You're out of shape. You're out of shape. Maybe you're here and you feel like all the work of the church is, 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 on the, is on the shoulders of the leadership. Paul says we should be praying ourselves into the equation to be the instrumentation of God's use. Maybe you're here and you just want prayer. You can come down right now and request prayer. 
Maybe you don't want to walk down by yourself. The prayers of the righteous availeth much. That's why we're here. We are a community of believers to encourage and strengthen one another. We're not here to point out faults and pull back the, pull back the, the sheets to, to expose sin. But we're here to be the hands and the voice of God and encourage and love one another and say, you know, I, I know you're not perfect. I'm not perfect either. But I got you. And I'm going to walk beside you and I'm not going to judge you. You may be asking, well, what do I need to do to be a child of God? Well, you must hear the gospel. The gospel message is that Jesus lived and he died according to the scripture. But the power of that message is that Jesus accomplished it all through his life, burial, and resurrection. There's no amount of prayers that you need to pray. There's no amount of oils you need to be anointed with. God has, Christ has accomplished it all through his life and his sacrifice. But not only that, you must believe this. He that cometh must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you believe that he is a rewarder? Or do you possess that demonic faith? You see, demonic faith is that I believe in God, I just don't do what he says. Demons believe in God. But they don't do what he says. That's demonic faith. Or do you have that faith that is written about in James, a faith that works? You're not saved by works, but you're saved for works, church. Get that. But you also must confess Christ and say, He that confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father which art in heaven. He that will deny me, him will I also deny. But then you must repent and be baptized. As according to Acts 2 and 38, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're asking and we're pleading that you do this right now as we sing the song of encouragement.